Hi, I'm going to talk to you today about um, women winning the right to vote in New York State via a referendum that was successfully passed in 1917. I'm going to show you some PowerPoints along the way. So gaining suffrage was a very long process, as I'm sure you know. It started arguably in 19, 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention. Um, November 1917, though, um, in New York was a, was a pivotal point. As you know, the, the National Suffrage Amendment was passed in 1920, so only three years later. And New York was the first state east of the Mississippi to give full voting rights to women had 45 electoral votes, 43 House seats. So it was very important in the politics of getting the National uh, Suffrage Amendment, 19th Amendment passed as well. So I wanna tell you how this important victory came about, um, how New York women took on this really huge political challenge and succeeded. Um, nationally, the suffrage, uh, amendment, suffrage uh, movement um, were, was focused initially not on voting. Is, uh, the Seneca Falls Convention, in fact, was mostly focused on things like giving women property rights, allowing them to keep their children when they were divorced, ask, having access to employment and education. And, and some people at that convention thought that suffrage was just too radical an idea and that women shouldn't uh, put their emphasis on that. Um, the division continued about how important suffrage was and also through the 19th century about how suffrage uh, should be uh, achieved, whether you should go for a national amendment or whether it should be done state by state, locality by locality. Um, by the, toward the end of the 19th century, two factions, uh, the, the state people who wanted to go state by state and people who wanted to work nationally had reunited and created the National American Women's Suffrage Association or NASA. Uh, NASA continued to demand a federal amendment, but um, also supported women who were working in states to get what was called partial suffrage. So to get women uh, the ability to vote in school board elections or local elections or state elections, for example. Um, now, during this time, and this is rel these next two slides are relevant to this, the arguments made in favor of women's rights to vote were moral arguments, I guess I would say. Moral partly, as this first slide shows, it's just, you know, it's the right thing to do. You know, women are half the population, they should have the right to vote. The other way, the moral, another way that the moral argument was made very frequently is that women would clean up politics, would clean up cities, would clean up corruption. So I like this one. This is about giving it, uh, an argument, a political cartoon that argues that women should be given, particularly the municipal ballot, to vote in cities. And they would clean up, you can see the sweatshops, unclean bakeries, uh, street, streets and playgrounds for children, the social evil there, which is prostitution in the, down in the lower right-hand part. From habit of force, she will clean this up. So the, the notion was that women were used to kind of cleaning up messes and making things nicer, and that's what they would do if they got into politics. They would clean up corruption and so forth. Um, as the 20th century began, um, Younger readers like Carrie Chapman Catt, Maud Wood Park, Harriet Stanton Blatch, who was Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, had new ideas. They thought that moral arguments were not really enough, that male politicians needed to see that it was in their political interest to enact suffrage. So these women wanted to take, undertake really more hardball political strategies. And um, they felt that state victories, even partial suffrage, would allow women to participate and put pressure on men. So that was a good thing to be pushing for. Um, and then the next step would be that men representing suffrage states, if you could get the suffrage in enough states, would presumably support suffrage in Congress. So the state suffrage 
uh, legislation was good in itself, and it also would put pressure on uh, the national government. Their tactics that these younger women uh, pushed, they first of all, they wanted to reach out to newer generations of college-educated women, to women's clubs and other organizations. They used some tactics borrowed from English suffragists, including parades, mass meetings. Here's an example of a parade in New York uh, with cars and banners and so forth and so on. Um, they built political coalitions with progressive organizations, including uh, labor unions, the National Consumers League, uh, women's organizations. They put pressure uh, on President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson at the time, by publicizing the fact, in part by publicizing the fact that women had supported the war effort or were supporting the war effort during World War I. Uh, you're probably also familiar with the fact that they chained themselves to the gates of the White House and uh, went on uh, hunger strikes and so forth and so on. Um, so I want to focus on uh, the New York suffrage campaign in this context, in the context of a newer generation of women really wanting to pin down suffrage. New York women had always had a wide range of goals and tactics. Um, and uh, interestingly, I think, while the story of the national level women's suffrage movement was uh, one of um, sort of repeated failures until its ultimate success in 1920, the story of the New York Women's Suffrage Association uh, is really one of minor but repeated successes. So uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage and other New York women focus not just on voting but on legislation including property and custody rights. They managed to attain voting rights for women in school board elections in the 1880s and 1980s and 1880s and 1890s. Um, the right of women property owners to vote on measures concerning assessments and tax uh, increases. Later, the right to of all women to vote on tax propositions in villages and towns. So this is important, I think. They, they adopted this incremental change uh, position. And this, I believe, helped women became, become comfortable with politics and perhaps men to become a little bit more comfortable with women in politics and likely helped create uh, support for full suffrage. So how did they win? They wanted to um, do this, they planned to do this through a referendum. And their first attempt at uh, a New York wide public referendum was in 1915. And they, that, despite all their hard work, the suffragists lost that vote by almost 200,000 votes out of over uh, 1.2 million cast. Only six counties approved. Broome, Chinmung, Chautauqua, Cortland, Schenectady, and Tompkins, so they were all upstate counties. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you three ways that I, three reasons, I think, three paths by which the suffragists succeeded in um, getting the re referendum passed two years later in 1917. One is they learned from the past, especially from this 1915 unsuccessful referendum. Uh, they systematically, under Carrie Chapman Catt, analyzed what they had done right and what the mistakes were. For example, Catt realized that um, a lot of people connected the women's suffrage movement with the temperance movement, the Women's Christian Temperance, temperance Union, and that meant that many voters connected suffrage to Protestantism. So she made sure in the next two years to reach out to, to Catholics and Jews as well. Some other takeaways from their analysis that they conducted in, in 1915, uh, at that point in 1915, there had been other referendums on the ballot, and that diluted kind of the support or confused voters. Um, they made sure by political pressure on the legislature that there would only be one referendum, the women's suffrage referendum in the 1917 election. Secondly, the amendment lost, but 42% favored suffrage and a high percentage of voters didn't vote, male voters this is now, you remember, 
and Carrie Chapman Cap framed this as a half a million voters who were potential converts. She had a very positive take on this. Um, finally, looking at the county breakdown, and they analyzed very uh, specifically where the, su the suffrage amendment uh, referendum had failed and where it succeeded. Looking at the county vote breakdown, it was clear that the better organized they were, the more volunteers they had in the county, the better the referendum did. All right, so they analyzed their first set of mistakes, learned from the past. Secondly, they continued and intensified their traditional grassroots organizing. And this begins to seem very contemporary. Uh, the New York Women, State Women's Suffrage Association had long used a grassroots approach um, similar to other 19th century uh, civic organizations. They had county organizations and under them city and village groups. Uh, they had created a simple constitution that you could use if you wanted to start a group. These groups, also often called political equality clubs in rural areas, quickly spread throughout the state in the late 19th century. Um, annual conventions brought members together. Uh, and this organization was, this type of organization was very familiar. There were other women's clubs and civic organizations organized in the same way. And women had had a lot of civic experience in their churches, granges, uh, and various other civic organizations. By the time that they're working on this um, referendum in uh, 1917, there were over 200 local suffrage organizations or political equality clubs in, uh, in New York. Um, and this, in this particular time, as we saw in the 1915, uh, vote, there was more support for suffrage in the upstate, in upstate New York than in New York City. Given that, the leaders decided they really needed to reach out into, to other women. They needed to re reach out to immigrant women, immigrant working women, African American women, inhabitants of New York City. They really needed to push the city toward um, a positive vote. And they, they're reaching out, remember, both to men who are going to vote on this and to women who are going to uh, push men in their families to vote. Um, so they, they did many things in terms of reaching out to these other groups. So African-American women's groups, for example, they made connections with those. Uh, immigrant groups, um, they developed in during the 2017 campaign, uh, developed suffer and distributed suffrage literature in 26, 26 different languages to immigrant women's groups. As they prepared for this 1917 campaign, um, they had over a million dues paying women members. And Carrie Chapman Catt wanted to use the members uh, to emphasize education, educating women and men and organization until she said, and this is a quote, behind the door of every house there is a suffragist. To accomplish this, they built an organization that looks a lot like contemporary party organizations. The state was divided into 12 districts, upstate, each county had at least one leader, each city had at least one leader. They also hired recent college graduates to go out and be political organizers. Uh, and some of the, the this really interesting description of this campaign comes from diaries of these college women. Um, their ultimate goal, of course, was to get male voters to support the suffrage amendment, but they also wanted to get women to sign petitions saying they wanted to vote. So the opponents of women's suffrage in New York, one of their central arguments that, you know, women really didn't want to vote. They didn't care. They were happy the way it was. They didn't need to vote. They didn't want to vote. So suffragists spent a lot of effort and time going door to door everywhere in New York. Uh, it, this is, involved thousands of volunteers, many of union members and other civic groups, to collect signatures on a petition. Uh, they collected signatures over one million women who said they wanted to vote. This is the largest individually signed petition ever assembled at that time, eventually to totaling 1,030,000 names, a majority of the women in New York State. 
Um, uh, this is the, the organizers, the New York State Women's Suffrage Association. Here are uh, the, um, the actual, some of the actual petitions which are in the New York State Museum. And here's a parade in New York where you can't see it, but all the white things that people are carrying in this parade are copies of those signatures with all the many, many, many millions of million, 30,000 names on it. Uh, in addition, in the final push to get the referendum passed in November 1917, workers sent a postcard to every enrolled member of this New York State Women's Suffrage Association. They also provided directions for poll watchers. They enlisted men with cars to transport voters to the polls. They had somebody present at each polling place to make sure that all the male suffrage supporters that they knew about actually showed up. Again, this sounds very familiar, <laughs> the get out the vote effort. So they learned from their past mistakes. They undertook extensive organizing. And third, they directly lobbied male politicians. And, and this is uh, interesting. They, they, they first had to deal with them, as I've mentioned, to, to get, to make sure that this was the only referendum on the ballot in uh, 1917. Um, beyond that, one of the goals of the suffragers, suffrage organizers was to win over influential local male politicians as a way to persuade other men to vote for the uh, suffrage referendum. Uh, there are some important indicators of how successful this strategy was. You probably know that Tammany Hall was the powerful New York City Democratic organization at this time. And they had been opposed to suffrage in 1915. But through this lobbying effort, they became convinced that women voters could be useful to them. So in October 1917, one month before the referendum was uh, going to be voted upon, Tammany withdrew its opposition to women's suffrage. They took a neutral stance and at the same time appointed 34 women as members of their organization. This effectively gave Tammany support to suffrage and was a huge benefit, as you can imagine, in New York City, uh, as well as the state more generally. Um, and at least on paper, both the state organizations, the party, the state Republican and Democratic organizations um, were supportive of women's suffrage. This was a flip from 1915. The results. The November 6, 1917 women's suffrage referendum was approved by 102,000 votes, 54% of the voters statewide. The biggest change in voter sentiment came in New York City metropolitan area where 59% approved it. And it won in every borough of New York City. It lost upstate overall, but won in the cities of Auburn, Binghamton, Buffalo, Newburgh, Oswego, Schenectady, and Syracuse. Uh, lost in Albany and Rochester. Here is the New York Times the day after the um, the day after the uh, election, where it says women's suffrage win probably by eighty thousand votes. Um, there are many reasons, as I started with saying, that New York victory was a turning point. It was the first state east of the Mississippi to enfranchise women. It had a large number of electoral votes. President Woodrow Wilson changed his position to support suffrage in 1918. Um, and then in the next year, 1918, in part thanks to support from New York's congressional representatives, the national amendment uh, was approved by Congress. These are all indications that the New York victory in 1917 really changed the political landscape for the suffrage movement. Thank you very, very much.